Hello there and welcome to you talking to me. Today, around 30 million of people are suffering from rare diseases. The costs of drugs and treatments for them are really high. How could the EU then reduce the prices of these orphan drugs? And do we need a EU fund to tackle these rare diseases? Or do we need some private funds? This is the discussion we have today with my two guests. Edith Frenois, you market access director from the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. Hello. Hello. And Philippe de Bakker, you're a Belgian member of the European Parliament from the Liberals and Democrats groups. Hello. Hello and welcome both of you. So um, the EU considers a disease where as it affects fewer than one in 2,000 citizens. So according to the European Commission's figures, rare diseases affect 6, 8% of the population, so which means around 30 million of people. And uh, some high orphan drugs, such as Sovaldi for hepatitis C, cost more than 75 million euros per patient. So uh, Mr. De Bakker, what could the EU do to lower these prices? I think first of all you have to understand how these drugs come into the market. Um, before a drug is uh, delivered to a patient, usually between 10, 15, sometimes 20 years of research goes, goes into that. So there's a huge investment from private companies involved before a drug is being developed. Then, of course, the drug, once it's uh, developed, has to go through a whole process, a regulatory process. There is at the European level market access. But then the discussion starts with separate member states on the reimbursement. And so the proposal that I've made specifically for orphan and rare diseases is to make sure and to see if we cannot do this at European level, to make sure that we create a system at European level where this health technology assessment, so whether or not a drug is considered uh, efficient and, and is really helpful to the patient, is being done at the European level. Today it's done at the national level. And secondly, following that, if it's also not possible to do a system where the different payers at national level come together at European level to negotiate together. Because as you said, there are not my many mm -hmm. patients, so therefore also the cost of the drugs go up. And so if we can bundle all the patients in Europe, I think then we can negotiate a better price for them. So Mrs. Frenois, for the pharmaceutical industries in Europe, it's not that easy to lower the prices of these products. Well, I, I just want to, you know, concur with what uh, Mr. Debaka said. Um, I think what's important to realize is that uh, uh, the industry has made an investment to develop these these drugs. So um, this uh, investment that was made up front is 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 done and is sunk and is you know gone, let's say. So whatever industry is then recouping in terms of uh, prices that are uh, set for for the products that reach the patients is uh, money that the industry can receive for to sustain innovation and for future investments. Mm -hmm. So what we're talking about is not, you know, the price of a drug to pay for the investment of that drug, is is um, money that goes into the system, into the system for investment into future innovations. You said it, that uh, there are 30 million uh, people suffering from rare diseases. There are many patients that uh, don't have a treatment yet today because there are many diseases that have not been tackled yet because there are complex diseases. Yeah. Even though investment is, is happening in many areas, Areas there are still areas where investment is needed and discovery is needed and research is needed and that's what is made possible uh, by mm, paying okay. for today's drugs. Okay, so all these prices differ from one member state to another one and even within the country itself, as this is the case in Spain. And actually, we have one recorded question from Andrea Diaz, our Spanish UNED Plus partner from Castilla y León Radio. We listen. In the case of Spain, there is a decentralized health system. That means that the regional governments are responsible for the cost of orphan drugs. That's why the Spanish Federation for Rape Disease has requested changes and also invest in research. But do you think the European Commission has the power to establish a price regulatory framework to be followed by 28 governments? So, Mr. De Bakker, could you answer to Andrea? Well, the basic answer is no. Eh? The, the reimbursement of, of drugs and medicines is still a, a national competence. Eh? It's regulated at, at national level. So, I think especially in the case of orphan drugs and, and rare diseases, I think many health ministers today struggle with the high cost of the novel drugs and innovative drugs which are coming to the market. And so, I think especially in these cases where you have a very limited set of patients, I think Europe can help to coordinate. And part of my proposal that I've made in the European Fund is indeed also not 
only do the technology assessment at the European level, but also try to negotiate the price at the European level. This does not mean that when the national payers are buying into the European fund, there will not be price differences which, the, which can still be set. So I think, again, it will be an advantage for the pharmaceutical industry because they only have to negotiate once, but at the same time for the payers because they will pay a lower price. And Mrs. Frenois, will this affect the pharmaceutical industries? Do you think? So I think that the question is rather, you know, it's not really if it's possible to have one European price, but if it's desirable. And I would say it's not desirable because what we consider is that the differences in prices, price dif uh, discrimination, let's say, between countries is actually improving access for the patients. It's not possible that uh, a system like in Germany, where you have a, a, you know, a healthcare system that has uh, resources to a certain level, pays the same as uh, Romania, for example. It would not be fair, it would not be sustainable for either system. So for, for us, what we see is that differences in prices mm -hmm. helps access for patients. Mm -hmm. So one price in Europe would not help in yeah. that sense. Yes, and actually, I mean, we have a reaction on our Facebook page. Alenka wrote, uh, what would change for pharmaceutical industry because they create a patent on the drugs and after they propose the price that they want. So this won't change uh, the work of uh, pharmaceutical industries then. Well, first of all, I would like to challenge what the, the comment was saying, because it's not that uh, the pharmaceutical industry is, is charging whatever price they want. You know, as Mr. Debaka said, you have regulations, price regulations at the national level, and systems are very complex in some cases. And you have a monopsony, meaning well, usually at the national level, one buyer, which is the government. And the pharmaceutical industry has to negotiate with that one very powerful buyer. So I wouldn't say that the industry is just charging whatever they want. They are negotiating. They have to go through a process. They have to prove the value through HTA. And, and then at the end, a price comes out. And so it's it's yeah. a negotiation. But then another solution, I mean, maybe can be if there are some, I mean, not a lot of people really affected by this rare disease, is maybe to have a European fund just to help them to cure their diseases. So that's the question uh, that our uh, Polsky radio partner, Roberto Galli, asks. And he's reacting from Poland. Many specialized medicines, so-called orphan drugs, which are aimed to treat a rare disease, cost millions to develop and have a limited customer base, so prices are usually extremely high. Many patients in Poland have voiced their frustration that since such medicines have such a low demand, the local authorities have not included them in a list of refunded medicines. This means that patients suffering from these rare diseases sometimes have to foot bills of thousands of euros. Is there a way that the European Union can collectively vet drugs so that they are approved across the whole bloc and not on a country-by-country -country basis? Mr. De Becker, would a new fund be one solution based on private and public funds? I think the, the question is, is the right one. Eh? So you have to make a... In my proposal that I've made on the European Fund, it's very clear that it's a benefit to the pharma companies because they get a European HTA. It's a cost saving for them. At the same time, the payers get a much powerful uh, place to negotiate at European level bundling patients. But also for the patients, ultimately, it's much better because there will be no more discrimination whether or not a certain region or a certain country decides yes or no to reimburse uh, a certain drug. So the access is guaranteed for all patients across the European Union. And of course, we have to continue also to invest in innovation and there the private funds comes in. Because if the, the drugs which are being developed often starts in the lab, goes through a startup company, a small biotech firm, and is then further developed with the help of the pharma company. So investing and making sure that these startup companies also have enough money to grow, that's also a very important part of what we do at European level, namely the capital markets union, venture mm -hmm. capital passports. And in that way, we try to attract private money to start the innovation. But on the other side of the spectrum, when the drug is on the market and needs to be reimbursed, there also a European uh, solution might be helpful. Mm. So, Mrs. Frenois, how can we tackle this such low demands? I mean, compared to higher price. So, okay, <coughs> there is a there is low demands, but. What could we do when, when, and with that? I think it's a question of sustainability and a question of predictability. So it's sustainability for the healthcare system that they can you know, afford uh, the medicines that are needed for the patients. It's about predictability, again, for the healthcare system, managing the budget, and predictability for the industry so that the industry can 
plan ahead because, you know, as we said already, development is a lengthy process. And if you're not sure that you will have the funds necessary to develop and to go through the whole, all the phases that you, you need to go through for development, you will not invest in the first place. And I think that there are solutions and, and companies are actually already uh, engaging with governments and negotiation and in innovative uh, schemes, innovative pricing schemes at the national level with managed entry agreements, for example. And I think that Belgium has a, a extensive experience in that. And these are, are linked to commitments to follow patients, to collect data on outcomes, to really understand what the products bring. And then you can link that to some uh, review of prices also. And I think this, this is really something that companies are committed to and is a future for a sustainable and predictable environment mm -hmm. that would be good both for the system and for the company. So let me, I mean, uh, take an example. So if a Romanian uh, patient has a rare disease and needs a, a treatment, can he buy the treatment in Belgium, for example, where, is it, where it is cheaper or more uh, available? I think in, in the system as it works today, this is very difficult. Um, <clears throat> we set up at European level uh, Orphanet. We try to work together to bring the centers of excellence and expertise together to also have early diagnosis because often these patients walk around a long time with their disease before they get appropriate treatment. So the proposal that I've made also includes the fact that we try to raise the standard of care across the European Union, especially in those countries where today the standard of care is not up to date with other member states. But in the end, one, one can think about the fact that not every member state will have to have the same expertise and all the expertise has to be duplicated in every member state. So in the end, when you have uh, cross-border cross patient healthcare, mm -hmm. then it might be more interesting to send a patient from Poland to Germany to be treated there and also maybe less expensive than to set up a completely specialized center for a couple of patients in Poland themselves. And then, of course, the European Fund helps again because then the access for the drug on the market is dealt with at European level. Mm. And focusing now on research instead of uh, lowering the, the prices, so we could also think about investing on smaller specified industries in orphan drugs um, and this is uh, we have a question a last question for um, German partner from AMS Radio Claudia Knopke Market researchers see in orphan drugs future products, less massware drugs, more specialties. The market for orphan drugs last year had a value of 97 billion US dollars. It could double by 2020. The researchers also see the possibility for a changing landscape, away from big pharmaceutical companies towards more biotech companies. If so, wouldn't it make sense, rather than hoping to negotiate good prices with the big companies, to rely on targeted EU funding for the small and young companies in order to help them to develop specialties? Mrs. Frenois, what do you think? FPA actually works with uh, Europa Bio. The European Association yeah. for Bio. So we, yeah, we we do work with with uh, companies of all sizes, so big companies and smaller companies. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know the the question is targeted about how to foster research, basically, and I think there's a lot happening, and the EU is also very engaged with providing also funds to support research. There's the IMI, the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which helps also to to uh, get some academics together with industries together to to really um, work on on research projects. So. There is already a lot happening in terms of providing funds to, to support research. When it comes to developing specific products, I think what we have consistently seen is that uh, basic research is indeed shared between public partners and, and private partners. But when it comes to development and actually you know, producing uh, medicines, this is really something that the private sector has, has taken on. And this is simply linked to the fact that it's a huge risk. Uh, many drugs don't make it, so many projects of mm -hmm. drugs don't make it to the end. So many investments that are, you know, put uh, to to projects fail and, and it's lost money. And for the public, it's just something that is too risky to take. And that's why the private has taken this role to develop medicines. And I think this will continue to be the case in the future. Okay, Mr. Debacker. Well, in, in my previous life, before being in the parliament, I worked for a venture capital firm, an investment firm, which invested in biotech companies. And we basically always looked at the whole sector as an ecosystem. You need the smaller companies to take initial risk, but you also need the larger companies, uh, like was explained, the cost of doing the later stage research 
goes into the hundreds of millions. And this is not fundable by a single entity. So you need larger companies to be able to take that risk and to absorb that risk of also projects failing. And so you will need to have a mix between young startup companies, fast growing, pushing new products and new drugs into the market. But at the same time, you will need the larger scale companies to take the risk of doing the latest stage research, which is really, really expensive. And I think that both together, then we have a healthy ecosystem. And Europe is also supporting that by financing research through Horizon 2020, mm -hmm. by making much more risk capital available in member states, but also by trying to increase the competitiveness of the pharma industry in Europe. Mm. So uh, the last word before ending this program. So what is it, Mrs. Frenois, your priority now to tackle this rare disease? Well, I think that what the companies are really committed to is to improve patient care and improve access to treatments. And that's something that a cross-border collaboration can actually really support and we welcome in that sense any initiatives such as the one that Minister Debecca is involved in that work on, uh, for example, horizon scanning, really planning ahead what is coming, uh, in, what is in the pipeline, what payers will need to face. Uh, HTA collaboration and the European Union is very active on that, so really working together on our European assessments of relative efficacy, for example, and following drugs uh, afterwards, so collecting data once products are on the market. I think these can really support providing the right information to, to increase patient access to medicines. Mm. And you, your next step, uh, the European Parliament to push up this EU regulation? Um, well, first of all, I think we have to think ahead. Um, we are entering the age of personalized medicine. And it's, this basically means that all diseases will become orphan and rare diseases because they will become personalized. And so the whole healthcare system will have to be adapted and changed. And so my priority would be that we can help at European level to move that change forward to make sure that innovation continues to happen, but also that patients have access to the new drugs which come to the market because a drug which is too expensive is, is a drug which is not on the market. And so helping patients to get the access to care that they need and deserve is, I think, our priority. Thank you. Thank you both for coming. And thank you, you, for watching us and see you next week. Bye.